I'm Barbara Mead. I'm one of the founders of Politics and Prose, and I first introduced Norman Rosenthal back in 1998 when uh, he came out with his first book, uh, Winter Blues. And uh, tonight he's here to talk about his new book, The Gift of Adversity. Um, now, I don't think many of us have ever thought of adversity as a kind of gift that you would write a thank you note for. But, uh, but actually, by the time that you finish hearing Norman Rosenthal this evening, I think that you'll think twice about writing, writing a thank you note. Uh, in some ways, I think that uh, the gift of adversity is one long thank you note that Norm has written to adver um, uh, Dr. Rosenthal was born in South Africa and moved to the United States to complete his residential training. He was chief resident at New York um, at Columbia University Hospital, and uh, he was also at the New York Psychiatric uh, Institute. Uh, he was a researcher at the National Institute of Mental Health for over 20 years, and it was there that he pioneered the, uh, the study of um, Seasonal Affective Disorder, SAD, as, as the acronym is, uh, which is by a more common name, the winter blues or uh, depression as the daylight hours grow shorter. Uh, since his research, he has been, received the Anna Monica Foundation Award and for his depression research, and he is currently a, um, a clinical professor of psychiatry at Georgetown Medical School. Um, I just love the manner in which Dr. Rosenthal approaches his subject matter, which is by personal stories and anecdotes, beginning with his own. Um, as he um, writes, every patient has a story to tell, and the first story that Norman has to tell is actually of his own adversity, which has much to do with small motor control of his hands. Uh, now, I have to quote this before I bring Kay up, Kay up here. Um, Dr. Rosenthal writes, whenever I give talks, the part I enjoy the most is the Q&A at the end. It is so rewarding to interact directly with my audience. I'm, so, I'm excited to report that with today's tools and technology, we can now skip the lecture and go, <laughs> and go straight to the question and answer portion. Well, Norman, I hate to tell you, but uh, we're not going to begin with question and answer. You can skip the lecture because what I want you to do is just give us one of, the, one of those wonderful personal talks about adversity as you have witnessed it. Now I'm going to get Kay to formally bring you to the podium. Okay. Um, hi, I'm Kay Jamison from the Department of Psychiatry at Johns Hopkins. Uh, Dr. Rosenthal and I met over a common interest in the study and treatment of mood disorders. Uh, we met many years ago, and at that time, Norm was at the NIMH being one of the people most actively involved in delineating a particular form of mood disorder, namely seasonal affective disorder, as Barbara was saying. Uh, he did pioneering work on the validation of the criteria, the clinical descriptions of the symptoms, um, and the natural course of the illness, as well as the treatment. So that any of you who have seasonal affective disorder and have read about it or been treated for it will uh, be greatly indebted to Dr. Rosenthal for his work. He turned his interests uh, from the rhythms of the brain to writing and to more fundamental questions of human nature and motivation. And in the book just prior to this one, he turned his uh, interest to looking at what we know about meditation and why it works. The book Dr. Rosenthal, again, as Barbara said, will be discussing tonight is about adversity um, and in fact, I think there's a very long, long history of studying uh, the, the um, ad advantages of adversity. It's not something one signs up for, for sure, but given that every, unless you have an incredibly boring life uh, <laughs> and you live in a cocoon or in a fish tank, uh, hence the cover of the book, uh, then you will, in fact, have adversity. And one of the things uh, from my own experiences and my experiences with students 
and patience is to say that, you know, look, nobody's going to sign up for depression. Uh, nobody wants depression or mania or bipolar illness. Um, they're terrible. They're terrible to experience. They are awful with awful consequences. Nothing good comes out of that at the time, or very little good. But once it's over, um, you can reap benefits from it. And it is up to all of us to figure out the best way to harvest uh, that adversity that comes our way. And this is what Dr. Rosenthal has written about and will be talking about. Thank you. Thank you, Barbara, and thank you, Kay. Um, I do remember an, a paper of yours many years ago called Clouds and Silver Linings. And that's a little bit of what we're going to talk about this evening. And thank you all for coming. I know everybody's very busy and has a lot of competing things they may want to do. And I'm reminded um, a previous talk that I gave here maybe a decade ago, uh, my family and I uh, were driving here and there was literally a line around the block. And my wife said, you know, can they all really be here for your talk? I said, I, I don't think so. Well, it turned out that the 7-Eleven next door was selling Powerball tickets. <laughs> and it had gotten up to about 200 million or something. So, but today there's a wonderful crowd and I'm glad to see that they're not here for the Powerball. <laughs> I would like to start really uh, with a quote um, by uh, a really, uh, I think, brilliant British comedian and a friend called Russell Brand, who was kind enough to write something nice, he actually gave me two endorsements. The one's on the dust jacket and the other one the publisher declined to use <laughs> for reasons that will become apparent. He says, Doc Dr. Norm is a tender hooligan of brain fiddling. Here he defines adversity as a painful university for individual evolution. When I finished reading, I wanted to march into the street and get arrested just for the glorious adversity. <laughs> well, I want to just put it right up front that adversity is not something, obviously, that most of us seek out. And I don't encourage people to rush into the street for it. But it comes and finds us. And I would wager, as I look over the crowd here, that there are very few of us who have not been visited by one or other form of adversity, small or large. So we are left stuck with what do we do about it and what can we make out of it? How can we use, as Kay said, once the adversity subsides, how can we use the gift that comes with the adversity, which is very hard to see at the time? This new book here consists of 52 very short chapters. Each chapter begins with something somebody famous said. It's got a self-contained story. And then a little takeaway at the end in which I try to distill what I got out of the story and hopefully what I hope my readers will take away. The book was not initially conceptualized as being about adversity. It was really about lessons that I'd learned and the stories around those lessons. But as I reviewed those stories, it emerged that really adversity is our best teacher. And it makes sense from an evolutionary point of view that if we don't learn from when things go really wrong, we may not survive very long. So adversity is our best teacher and it has been said that you don't become a master sailor on calm seas. You learn through the rolling of the waves and the storms and the difficulties that come along. These stories in the book are not only taken from my own life, they're taken from the lives uh, of many others I've met along the way, some of whom have suffered really terrible adversities, like the Holocaust survivor Viktor Frankl, uh, people with mental illnesses, uh, or those who've suffered homelessness, drug addiction, imprisonment. Uh, but many of the stories are about milder adversities, because Adversities come in different sizes and forms. There are the sort of common cold types of adversities, and then there are the deadly disease types of adversities. 
So the way I have organized the book is in four parts. It starts off uh, with youth, which really involves what I learned growing up in South Africa, uh, where I grew up under two huge historical shadows that shaped a lot of what we did. The one was the Holocaust that had only been terminated five years before my birth, and the other one was apartheid that was going to continue, and racism in all its forms, that was going to continue for many years. Uh, and even uh, when I left the country, apartheid was still uh, in control, and it was unthinkable that things would change so, and especially that things would change in a relatively peaceful way, uh, thanks to a very great man who now lies ailing, uh, Nelson Mandela. Um, in terms of my own adversities that I talk about, some were very small, or, or relatively small, though in the life of a little boy, they loom large, like very bad, I, I could never connect a bat with a ball, or my foot with a ball. That just doesn't seem like a big deal. But if you're a little boy in a world where the soccer players and the cricket players are the heroes and you get picked last for the team, it doesn't feel that great. So, you know, what do you do with those experiences? How have they helped me as a psychiatrist when I deal with people who have some deficit of some kind. It may not be that exact same deficit. It may be an attentional deficit or some kind of sp specific cognitive problem. And over the years, I've often shared with them, you know, I understand because I had this particular deficit and people struggled to get me to connect the golf club with a golf ball. <laughs> and, uh, you know, my, my father would say, swing it, swing it, and I would swing it and a big divot of turf would fly up, and the ball would be sitting securely on the tee, you know, <laughs> showing no fear of being hit anytime soon. And he, so he took me to a pro, and the pro said, just feel the head, feel the head. And I sort of felt like turning the club over and kind of feeling the head, but I knew what he meant. He meant feel where it is in space. Imagine it. He, in his mind, he could feel where that head was. In my mind, there was no mapping of that thing at all. <laughs> and so that really helped me because I can understand people may have a problem. They may not be able to spell. They may not be able to read. They may have a fear of public speaking. These may be things that are not problems for me, but We've all got something. We've all got some adversity that we struggle with. And it's something that is a common bond between us. And it deepens our sense of empathy, or at least it can. That's one of the gifts of adversity. It deepens our sense of empathy and understanding of other people. It urges us to reach out and help them, especially they may have a different kind of problem. And in helping other people, we are ourselves healed in that process. That is, to me, one of the big gifts of adversity. Anyway, I digress. We were growing up in South Africa under those uh, circumstances. Some of the adversities, as I say, were small, but some adversities, you know, were quite large, like I was parked in a car with a girlfriend in Johannesburg, even before it became such a violent city. And I was attacked and stabbed almost to death. And yet from that terrible experience came one of the greatest gifts. Because after I recovered, I felt so grateful to be alive. It was such a feeling of being reborn that I never lost a sense of really needing to enjoy and experience and make the most of every day one has and every opportunity one gets, it, it just revitalized me and it made me understand how people feel soldiers when they come back from the war and they see the world depleted, the urgency of wanting to get married and have a family and repopulate a devastated world. 
those were some of the gifts. Anyway, um, the second part of the book is adulthood, and that starts with us coming to the United States, arriving in that amazing metropolis, New York City, that we had, we'd never been to the United States before, and I had accepted the residency on the basis of a, blo a glossy brochure and a recommendation from an old professor of psychiatry. And I guess uh, Columbia took me sight unseen as well. But we got along quite well. But one interesting thing that went on the very year I came is there was a massive hostile takeover of the institution, the New York State Psychiatric Institute and Columbia Presbyterian. The psychoanalysts, the old guard, were in retreat and the young Turks, the biological psychiatrists, were in advance, and they displaced these, these older folks. And it really was very instructive just to see how people handled this institutional takeover. It was to be very helpful to me later. But the biggest adversity that we suffered, both uh, my wife and I, was the short, dark days. We struggled through the winter. We'd never lived so far north in our lives. And of course, as Barbara and Kay mentioned, those were to yield amongst the greatest professional gifts that I've ever had, the opportunity to describe seasonal affective disorder and develop light therapy came directly from my intuition and conviction that the light was having a powerful effect on the brain. And in the early years, uh, people laughed. I had a colleague at a, a business, at a, at a professional meeting saying, come, let's stand under the light. I'm already feeling depressed. <laughs> and you know, you need that kind of internal conviction to really stand solidly behind uh, your research projects. So at the NIMH, I embarked on every researcher's struggle, and that's to find a question worth asking and then find the answers. And um, I see a, another dear friend of mine, Dr. Pamela Peake, is somewhere here in the audience. Over there, we, we went way back. She was busy measuring metabolic rates, and I was giving people bright light and hoping it would make it go faster. I never did find out whether it did or not. <laughs> She's shaking her head. All right. We can discuss it later. Um, anyway, so I, I, I did great for a long time, and then the institution changed, just like Columbia. Now, the neurologist Sydenham has said, of, and he was a 19th century neurologist, he made a very far-sighted comment about people with a so-called borderline personality disorder. He said, those they revere, they will soon revile. Well, institutions are often like that. And from being the darlings of the institution, we came, if not the pariahs, then the flotsam and jetsam that the new management wanted to cut out the dead wood and turn it around. Um, and I go into some detail about that in the, in the book. And here, here's an to me, interesting thing, because, you know, I would have thought I might be embarrassed to go into details about how one gets pushed out of an organization, but I really thought it was very important, because I think all over the country we're seeing these days people being downsized, rift, laid off, retrenched, whatever euphemism you want to find, it's people who have lots of capacities, who've served organizations very well, who remain very competent, but who, for the benefit of the organization, are now being shunted aside. And it's a major problem for people. It's a major adversity. I wanted to say, you know, there are ways to deal with it. There are ways to transcend it. There are ways to get beyond it. Which really brings me to several chapters in which I actually talk about fundamental ways to deal with adversity. Firstly, of course, you need to accept that the adversity has happened. That can be a problem, for example, in the loss of a loved one. There's a wonderful example in Joan Didion's Year of Magical Thinking, where after her husband dies of a heart attack, 
She doesn't want to get rid of his shoes in case maybe he comes back and he might need them. That's the kind of poignant thing that jumps out that makes you realize you haven't actually quite accepted an, an adversity. And so you do need to accept it, and then you need to analyze it. You need to try to understand what is this adversity and what is an appropriate response to it, not an overreaction or an underreaction. One chapter in the book uh, deals with uh, my mother, who was in her mid-70s, when she woke up in the middle of the night to find three young men on top of her, choking her, attacking her, assaulting her in various ways. And she immediately perceived these people wanted money and they wanted anonymity. That's fundamentally what they wanted. And through being choked and everything, she said, if you get off me, I will show you where the money is and I will escort you out of here and nobody will see your faces. And the miracle is that in the middle of the night, three young men actually listened to what an old woman had to say. Got off her, she gave them the money, showed them out of the house, and said, we won't turn on the lights, nobody has seen you, go. When the police came, they said, this is a very common crime here, the only unusual thing is that the victim is still alive. So I think about that as an example to me of presence of mind, analyzing a situation. Of course, every situation is different, and some situations, fortunately, you don't have to think that quickly. You've got the opportunity to reach out and get other opinions and take consultation, and whatever one can, one should. But it's a matter of analyzing a situation and then responding appropriately. One of the things that I talk about in terms of basic ways to cope with adversity is to cultivate good habits. Basically, good habits are habits that make your life better. Bad habits are the opposite. So people often respond to adversity if they go to drink or drugs or gambling or whatever to try to get away from the problem, they're compounding the problem. Whereas if they make sure that they're sleeping well, eating well, exercising, that is going to help them. The habits are really very, very important. And I'm dealing with this all the time in my practice in that, you know, the old idea was just have willpower. Make up your mind and do it. The new teaching is that willpower doesn't really stand the test of time. It wears out, it breaks down, it fails. But habits are remarkably useful once they are instituted. Yoga, meditation <laughs> brings me to one of my favorite topics, and it was really the subject of my last book, and that is uh, transcendental meditation. Now, there are many forms of meditation, insight, loving kindness, and all of them have their proponents, and I'm sure their advantages. But the one that really captivated me and I found too easy and cottoned onto most easily was TM. I had done it as a young man as in medical school, and then I left it. And then I came back 35 years later, urged by a patient. And that is another interesting thing to me. Like, you know, the, the classical hero's journey is the hero has a call to action. And I think when I talk about hero, I'm talking about each of us being the hero of our own lives. The hero has a call to action, something he or she very much wants to accomplish. And then he or she encounters obstacles along the way and has to access special gifts or special people who are mentors who show them the way. Well, in many instances, my best mentors have been my patients. And the only thing I've had to do is to listen is to not get locked into this concept that I'm the doctor here, you listen to me, that, that it's really a two-way street in terms of the exchange of wisdom. And this young man said, why don't you go back to meditation? It's really helped me. He had bipolar illness. He has bipolar illness. 
It had an incredible stabilizing effect on his illness. And he said, you should do it. So I listened and I started. And then he said, are you doing it? Said, I said, yes. He said, are you doing it regularly? <laughs> I said, well, not really. He said, now, how would you react if I didn't take my medications regularly? Uh, not very well. Well, that's the same. You, you do it regularly before you pass any judgment. So I did. And what I found was that bit by bit, it really changed me. I became more patient. I became calmer and more focused. And in fact, in the last four or five years since I've been meditating, I've written three books and revised a fourth after a 10-year hiatus in which I wrote nothing. So it's done an amazing thing in terms of really helping me think coherently. But uh, meditation can also be amazing for people with really terrible adversities, much worse than writer's block. I have a whole chapter on these people who have had a terrible triad of drug abuse, homelessness, and imprisonment, and have managed to extricate themselves from that in part with the help of meditation. Other things I talk about in separate chapters, uh, reach out to friends, family, and community, get help. Um, I've seen many, uh, for example, somehow very competent women who have terrific careers and also run a home and family somehow don't always feel entitled to get the help they need. They're doing everything. They're being superwoman. But it's impossible. There are not enough hours in the day. And men somehow, I think, feel more entitled to help than women do. But in any event, whether you're a man or a woman, if you can and you can't do something yourself, my yoga teacher always used to say, if you want a helping hand, look at the end of your right arm. Well, that's all very well. But I don't think many of us have enough hands, and we need some extra ones. Tell a story. There's an amazing uh, a body of research about the power of writing down your thoughts and feelings, how it organizes your thinking, how it leads you to solutions. Uh, so we talk about that. And slowly the adversity may take on new shapes as you find meaning and value in things that might previously have seemed unmitigated disasters. In one section, I deal with heroes. It's not a long section. And I know that there are great world figure heroes, but these are mostly personal heroes. And I think that if you all think of your own lives, you will think of those people who are personal heroes. They may be a parent who goes to work every day to a job he or she hates just to keep the family afloat, or a child maybe with a disability who struggles on bravely and is an inspiration to all around him or her. Uh, these may be our personal heroes. I was named after a hero. My, my own name comes from an uncle of mine who died at age 21 on a battlefield in North Africa during World War II. At age 21, very few of us have accomplished much worth talking about. But his accomplishment, as best I know, was as much in his death as in his life. Because with the good fortune, a field padre happened to be attending to him when he died up in the deserts of Libya. And a very astute journalist wrote an article about that experience. What apparently had happened is he was bleeding, slowly bleeding to death. They couldn't stop it. And water was rationed in short supplies. And he declined to accept water because he said there were others who had a better chance of living than he did and deserved the water more. And somehow, it gives me great joy that I was able to tell that little story that would otherwise have been lost in the desert sands and relay a, a level of courage that I think was probably shown by millions of people that we don't even know about. Millions of acts of courage by that great generation who fought that great war 
uh, and uh, so he's one of my heroes, and uh, there are others too. A cousin of mine who was locked up under the apartheid government in solitary confinement and tortured has been kind enough to share his story in detail with me and so on. And then one of the world heroes that I had the good fortune to meet, Viktor Frankl, who wrote the very great masterpiece, Man's Search for Meaning. I was lucky enough to meet when he was 90 years old and fully lucid and fully willing to answer any questions that I had about his time in the death camps in Auschwitz, uh, his experiences there, his feelings about the role of the Germans. And he actually said something very profound, and, and to me it was very important. He said, you know, of the ordinary Germans, you cannot blame them because you weren't there. Those were very, very dangerous times, and it's not right to ask another person to be a hero. If you want to be a hero, be a hero, but it's not right to ask it of others. And it kind of gave me a sense of dispensation for the fact that in South Africa, growing up in the apartheid regime, with all that injustice around me, and having done nothing of any consequence to turn it over, because everybody was frankly dead scared, with good reason, it gave me a sense of, yeah, I, I can relate to that. And it helped me feel for ordinary Germans who were caught in that position. In the last part of the book, I talk about goodbyes. And I know that that's an adversity that we can all relate to because those of us who've reached a certain age, most of us have had to say goodbye to one or both of the people who were so dear to us, our parents. And I was recently talking with a friend of mine who is tending to his very seriously ailing mother. And he said, you know, the time I spend with her is the gift of adversity because I have grown to love her more now in these times than I ever did in my whole life. And that's been a gift to me. So that was very moving to me. And in a similar vein, um, my own mother, who was a sort of hero to me, as you can imagine from the story I told you, she was an unusual woman. Uh, when she died, uh, which she slipped away from us, you know, the death of our parents sometimes comes painfully suddenly and sometimes painfully slowly as they slip away. She was the slipping away variety, and so it was foreordained that I would be 10,000 miles away and my other sister would be 10,000 miles away. And when we flew back after her death, joined our other sister there, went through all the trappings, uh, we were sort of sitting around and somebody said, well, we better go find the will. Now, she had very little financially, so there was no great purpose to it other than we knew it was like another link that we had with her. So we went to find it and there with a will, was an undated letter to the three of us, which I excerpt here. Dear children, I feel that during my lifetime I haven't told you sufficiently often how much I love you. You have been three shining lights throughout my life, a mother's pride and joy. I wish you all a long and healthy life and have as much pleasure and happiness from your children as I have had from mine. Well, that sort of unlocked the floodgates of our grief. And we all cried our eyes out, as you can imagine, uh, at these words of kindness and also not really asking anything of us, not sort of trying to control or influence beyond the grave. But they were the words of someone who had the capacity to imagine what would the world be like when I am no longer in it. What will my children need to hear from me? And that's been a powerful lesson to me, if you like, a gift from the adversity of losing her. And it's a gift that I share in, in my book. And uh, the idea being to me to think of a world after we're gone and what kind of a world we want that to be. That's in general terms. 
But in very specific and personal terms, if we think about the people we love, the people who mean a lot to us, to think about them when we're no longer here and how much they miss us, and to remember while we're still alive that it's never too late to say I love you. Thank you.